Today, I'm going to talk about hair supplements. This is a really big topic, so I'm going to put out a few videos on this, but this video is going to talk about biotin and also the supplement industry and things to watch out for and know about in general when thinking about taking supplements. I'm Dr. Blake Brooks. I'm a board certified dermatologist and hair specialist, and I make videos on all things related to hair. If that sounds like content you're interested in, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. And if you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. Let me know what else you'd like to learn about in the comments. Hair supplements are often the first step in many people's journey to treating hair loss because they can start taking them before they have anything else evaluated. Unfortunately, it can be really, really challenging to find hair specialists, and there is a shortage of dermatologists, which makes access a problem. So supplements play a really big role for a lot of people. There are also some patients who just feel more comfortable taking supplements than prescribed medications. And while I always tell my patients the best data that we have is definitely for medications that are prescribed or that were at one point prescription, I always understand that everybody has different priorities and want my patients to be on a regimen that makes them comfortable. Regardless of why, it's important to know what you're getting into when you purchase a hair supplement because there is truly, truly a large range with some being helpful and some actually being harmful. With all of that said, let's jump into supplements. The first supplement to discuss is biotin. Biotin is almost certainly the most common ingredient found in hair supplements, but not for any good reason. There is no clinical data backing biotin's inclusion in these supplements in that biotin has not been shown to improve hair quality or growth. And certainly if a person were biotin deficient or in a state that could predispose to biotin deficiency, sure, biotin supplementation could be important, but with a Western diet, biotin deficiency is exceptionally rare. And these supplements generally include levels of biotin that equate to anywhere from 8,000 to 32,000 times your daily need. That's a lot. And the real trouble with these supplements is that in addition to wasting people's money, they can actually be really dangerous. I don't mean that they're dangerous in the sense that you take one and you have a heart attack. What I mean is that they can mask or hide other potentially dangerous conditions or conditions that should be acted upon on routine lab tests. This is such a problem that the FDA has actually issued warnings about this on multiple occasions. And in a recent issue of the JAD, which is one of our largest peer reviewed journals in all of dermatology, there was a letter to the editor written by a prominent and well-respected dermatologist, Dr. Dirk Elston, entitled, First Do No Harm, Biotin for Hair and Nails. It was basically a call to action to dermatologists to inform patients of the risks of these supplements because they can be pretty dangerous. The reason for this is that a lot of common lab tests rely on what's called biotin streptavidin binding kinetics. What's important about that is that the problem with biotin is not specific to certain conditions, like the biotin isn't directly messing with your level of thyroid hormones. But the problem with biotin is related to the way we test for a lot of different conditions. So that's all to say that depending on the design of the test, you can have high levels of biotin lead to falsely decreased or falsely increased results of whatever is in question, and many tests use this. So things that can be affected, a lot, including thyroid tests, vitamin D, hormone tests, pregnancy tests, hepatitis tests, and here's the really big one, troponin tests. That was actually the main impetus behind the FDA's warning about biotin. Cardiac troponins are proteins that are found in the heart, and when you have a heart attack, the heart is injured, allowing those troponins to enter the bloodstream and become detectable. So if you go to the emergency department and have chest pain, it does not matter what emergency department you go to, any of them, they're almost certainly going to run blood work for troponins. People taking high levels of biotin can have falsely negative troponins, meaning you could be having a heart attack with elevated troponins and the test would show that everything is normal. We can see why that's potentially a very terrifying problem. And adding to that already big issue, the tests where biotin interferes are often those that are important to people with hair loss. So thyroid tests, pretty routinely run on my patients with hair loss as thyroid function can independently contribute to hair loss. Pregnancy tests, super important. Many of the medications and supplements we prescribe or recommend for hair loss, they're just not compatible with pregnancy. Vitamin D is often tested. We look to see if we can replete it when it's low. And hormones like FSH and LH are important to testing for PCOS, common cause of hair loss in women. Troponins are actually relevant too, and I'll cover this in another video, but there's actually a pretty good tie behind certain common types of hair loss and metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. In terms of side effects, it's otherwise fairly benign. You can have mild GI distress. It doesn't have any known drug interactions either, which is good. 
But all in all, biotin is kind of a bad player in my opinion, and it's pretty tough to avoid in hair supplements. Unfortunately, it's even included in a lot of the good supplements, but there's my two cents. A video on supplements of any kind would really be incomplete without at least a brief discussion of supplement regulation and the supplement industry in general. The supplement industry is enormous and it's growing. Globally, the market size for vitamins and supplements was 146 billion in 2023, 154 billion in 2024, and anticipated to grow to 250 billion plus by 2032. Now, other forecasts predict an even larger market size, but the point is it's growing at a breakneck pace. And they're also widely used, with studies suggesting that more than half of the U.S. population consumes a dietary supplement on a regular basis. Supplements fall under the purview of the FDA, but they fall under the same category as food. So there is a large difference in the way that the FDA operates with regards to supplements versus pharmaceuticals or prescription drugs. With supplements, the FDA does not ensure biologic activity, strength, or purity of ingredients. And supplement companies can take supplements to market without obtaining any clearance from the FDA. Supplement companies also aren't responsible for reporting adverse effects from supplements. It's voluntary. That's in stark contrast to makers of prescription drugs who are required to report adverse effects and maintain what's called strict pharmacovigilance. This has led to some to liken the supplement industry to the wild, wild west from a regulation standpoint, with pharmaceuticals considered potentially overregulated, creating kind of this spectrum of extremes. But what's more interesting is that while many supplement companies market themselves as safer alternatives to prescription medications by capitalizing on public distrust of pharmaceutical companies, many of these supplement companies have been purchased by big pharma, who are largely incentivized to buy into the supplement world due to it being far cheaper to develop supplements than to develop prescription drugs. For instance, Pfizer owns popular supplement companies Centrum and Emergency. Bayer owns One-A-Day. Nestle owns Garden of Life, and Unilever owns Ollie and Smarty Pants. Now, I'm not suggesting that larger pharmaceutical companies taking ownership of smaller supplement companies compromises the supplement company's products, but I think it's notable that many people move towards supplements to stay away from prescribed medications and the companies that produce them. This is also in no way to say that supplements don't have a place in your regimen. For many, I really think they do, and many supplements have evidence behind them in terms of their benefit to health, and for the purposes of this video, for your hair, but it is important to do your homework when it comes to supplements. Reports have described supplements contaminated with microbes, meaning in bacteria, and heavy metals, or supplements adulterated with prescription medications. In a previous FDA report surveying supplements, 776 were adulterated with prescription medications. That's kind of terrifying. So for this reason, it is imperative to ensure that any supplement you take is third-party tested by an independent laboratory. That's important because these labs confirm that the ingredients listed are actually what you are taking, and they also look for contaminants. You also need to realize that there's the possibility that supplements can interact with your medications or that there are some long-term safety issues that have not yet been discovered. There is a really great subscription service that I subscribe to called NatMed Pro that provides a lot of information about supplement ingredients, including drug interactions. They have a drug interaction checker. So that's a really helpful tool if you're going to invest in the time and money to take a supplement. Okay, I'm going to put out an additional video on supplements that have evidence behind them for hair loss. So look out for that and let me know if you've tried any supplements, if you've liked any, or if you've had good experiences or bad experiences with them. And I'll see you soon.